Hello. Uh, uh, thank you so much, and welcome to University College London. And I'm Dr. Bayas Ahmed, an associate professor here. I'm also the director of the UCL Humanitarian Institute, and we are proudly uh, co-organizing this event with the University of Dhaka and the Bangladesh High Commission in London. So, uh, so I'm not an inte intellectual uh, on the 1971 Bangladesh genocide, but uh, because, uh, but I thought we want to be part of this movement because uh, you remember uh, after our liberation war back in 1971, uh, we had because we are the post-1971 uh, generation. We didn't see the war, and we just read uh, and also watched different documentaries <coughs> and videos and books. But uh, we have lots of questions, uh, the new and young generation in our minds. And I'm, I'm really, really so happy and pleased to see we have freedom fighters here and also activists uh, who participated during the 1971 liberation war in Bangladesh. So a few things I want to raise today, because uh, you know uh, 10 million refugees we had back in that time, and 3 million martyrs, uh, uh, they sacrificed their lives for the freedom of Bangladesh. And also uh, millions of other people inside the country suffered in 1971. But there was a genocide. Uh, we all know and we all agree. That's why probably we are meeting here all together, the Foreign Ministry, Dhaka University, and also University College London. Uh, so the thing is, it took us 46 years uh, within the country, like within Bangladesh, to recognize the genocide happened. And it was first declared on 11th of March 2017, year 2017, to officially recognize uh, the March event in Bangladesh as a genocide. But the first question is why it took us 46 years. And then since then, the movement formally started from Bangladesh and now globally. Uh, so the Bangladeshi community and also our friends and other uh, family members, we we also are part of the movement. What we want to see, so it's been five years we are fighting for international recognition. So my question is, it's been five more years since 2000, it took 46 years to recognize within Bangladesh, then again five years we are, uh, we are uh, going to different international platforms and our ultimate target is to recognize the genocide in Bangladesh in 1971 through United Nations. And our question is uh, to all of you, the freedom fighters, and also to the foreign ministry, when we can achieve it? So it's 51 years gone, and how many more years we need to wait, and what would be the action plan from now onwards? Like, uh, whether it is going to take five more years, 10 more years, or 20 more years, and how, as a whole community, we are staying in different countries worldwide, can be united with the foreign ministry and the Bangladesh government and how we can get the ultimate justice for all those victims of 1971. Probably that should be, I want to, and we all want to see at this today's event, some guidelines from the foreign ministry and also from the speakers about that when, how, and how we can be involved in this journey. So thank you and welcome everyone. I hand it over to Thank you, Dr. Baez. I'm really proud that he's a very good friend of mine for years. And thank you so much for your support for today's event. Excellencies, now I'd like to request our uh, today's expert speaker for the symposium, Professor Imtia Ahmed from Center for Genocide Studies, University of Dhaka. Thank you. Thank you, Shadipto. Uh, His Excellency, uh, the Chief Guest, Mr. Mohammed Sharialam, Member of Parliament. Uh, Her Excellency, uh, my, my good friend, uh, Saida Muna Tasneem. His Excellency, uh, also uh, a very, very good friend, uh, Mr. Vikram Daraisami. <laughs> and of course, uh, dignitaries, 
uh, friends, uh, freedom <coughs> fighters, uh, those who are sitting down here. Uh, when we thought about uh, organizing this, the idea was, and I think uh, Bias has already flagged it, is how to move forward when it comes to recognizing this uh, event, or recognizing the genocide uh, at the highest level, uh, which would be the United Nations. Uh, and I think it's, it's, it's possible now, I'm quite optimist. Center for Genocide Studies was established around eight to 10 years back by the Dhaka University, because that's the epicenter of 71 genocide. Uh, and I'm quite hopeful that things are moving in the right direction. Now let me uh, give my thoughts on, on Bangladesh and, and why uh, this is very important. Now when it comes to Bangladesh and South Asia, there are two exceptionalities that other South Asian countries have not gone through. Uh, Bangladesh is the only people's republic that we have in South Asia. Uh, throughout the world, there are only five people's republic. There are several others though, but now only five. The oldest is North Korea. Then we have China. The third is Algeria. Fourth is Bangladesh. And the fifth one is Laos. And there are good reason why it was called People's Republic. Bangabundu never thought twice what would be the name, because it's written in our handwriting, People's Republic. Uh, there was never a debate whether it's a republic or democratic republic. He knew it, was, it had to be People's Republic. And there are good reasons for that. And that brings me to the second point, or second exceptionality. Bangladesh is the only country in South Asia which really fought a liberation war. One can talk about Shubhash Bosch a little bit though, but Shubhash Bosch never got into power. Uh, so from that point of view, uh, Bangladesh is the only uh, country which fought a liberation war, and I know there are uh, several freedom fighters here. Uh, myself, I was just a class nine student, uh, but I left my parents, uh, not telling them. I went to Agartala, literally slept on the pavement. So as a class nine student, I used to smoke then almost thought myself as Che Guevara. <laughs> so I'm sure each of you, those who fought, or those who survived 71, have, have stories to tell, extraordinary stories. And looking at the refugee camps, looking at the genocide, uh, believe it or not, the trauma never goes out. And I've always been anti-war <laughs> since then. And because war is not something one should go for. It's, 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 it's horrible, it's absolutely horrible. So whenever I see war, I, my, my immediate point is one has to start negotiation and diplomacy to stop war. And it doesn't matter wherever the war is. Now, these two factors, the two exceptionalities, is, you know, makes it clear uh, that you know, the genocide was, was a real one. Uh, Bangabundu did talk about genocide even to, before 25th March, warned the world, actually, that a genocide is coming, but nobody took uh, cognizance of that. But uh, on a series of speeches, particularly on the 7th March, uh, he probably knew that the Pakistan army would attack. And I was there on that playground, uh, Saradu Dan, listening to him, again as a class nine student. Uh, and we knew what to do if we are attacked. And the genocide took place, pl took place on 25th March, and then onwards we, we, we knew what to do. Uh, Dhaka University, as you have seen, uh, witnessed uh, uh, the gruesome atrocities. Uh, I was looking into other universities in other places of the world where genocide took place. Uh, from that point of view, Dhaka University is an exception. Uh, you don't have so many professors getting killed in, and students getting killed and staff getting killed in one university. Uh, from that point of view, it is it's very important. Now, why that is important, and, and if you ever visit Dhaka University, uh, we have something called the Walking Museum. Uh, you can actually roam around for two hours. The longer part is three hours, but two hours would be good enough to walk through Dhaka University to see 1971 genocide. I, I would request all of you, if you next time visit, uh, you can contact Center for Genocide Studies, and they'll be very happy to help you in that particular tool. Now, why the recognition issue is, is, is critical, and, and why 
uh, it ought to be done, I would say, immediately. Because the concept of genocide is a legally, internationally recognized concept. We can't change the concept. We can't use another uh, concept in another language to call genocide. Genocide is genocide is genocide. And so even, uh, you know, I see most of us are here, Bangla speaking, would know that we translate that into gonohatta. But gonohatta would be mass killing. Mass killing can be one element of genocide. Because genocide is absolutely a legally def defined term. We can't change it. What it means is intent to destroy. And that's important. Intent to destroy in whole or in part in four categories. That's also very important. The four categories are important. National, ethnic, racial, religious. That's it. Other are not, other are, uh, you know, offenses, punishable offenses, no doubt. Uh, political killing or other killing, those are punishable offenses, but not genocide. Now, if you have looked into the documentary on Dhaka University, there's a clear case of intent to destroy. Now, why a chemistry professor would be killed? Why a philosopher would be killed? Because the fellow was, had nothing to do with politics. And why the staff would be killed? We have a canteen called Mudur Canteen. Even the owner, Mududa, was also killed. His family was killed. Why a Mudur Canteen? So intent to destroy was very clear. And genocide doesn't have to be a number of killings is not important. That's very important. People think that you, know, you have to have millions have to die before uh, one has to call genocide. That's also not true. You can actually have genocide without killing, provided it's intent to destroy. If you separate the children from the parents, that also can be genocidal. And we know in contemporary time there have been instances in different places of the world where parents and children were separated. That also is genocidal. And in future, you will see that would also haunt those particular countries. So I think it's important that we have enough evidence now in 50 years, at least in the last 15 to 20 years, I would say research has been at a very high level. So on the question of I mean, evidence, uh, I don't think uh, there is any doubt whatsoever in anyone's mind that there's genocide. And not to mention the 10 million refugees and the number of rape victims, and you can go on and on. So here, I think this particular uh, uh, you know, gathering ought to decide what to do. Now, there have been some developments. Uh, yes, recognition becomes a geopolitical issue. Sometimes they would say, oh, genocides are not recognized by the United Nations. That is also not true. The Rwanda genocide got recognized, and I, I know the exact date, uh, 2004. Well, I know 7th April, because my birthday is 7th April, so I can't forget 7th April. <laughs> 2004, Rwanda genocide got recognized at the General Assembly where they passed a statement. So there are uh, precedents where the international community or the United Nations has recognized a particular genocide. Now, the changes of geopolitics have taken place, uh, have taken place uh, in a way where I think even the United States, uh, which was against uh, Bangladesh at that particular time, uh, I think there has been some developments, and we have seen uh, two members uh, have tabled a resolution in the Congress, and hopefully, when this discussions will be there, and when it will be approved, I, I believe even the President Joe Biden will understand why they have to recognize 1971 uh, genocide. But uh, we have the Honorable State Minister here who probably would be able to tell more. He's absolutely passionate about this issue. Uh, this documentary was part of his work also. I have to flag that, not to mention the documents that we have brought out. He's, he's very passionate about this recognition issue, and I'm sure he will be uh, moving forward uh, to this, uh, to make uh, this particular issue at least at the highest level to the United Nations so that justice uh, can be done uh, to those who have suffered uh, so much uh, 50 years back. So I am hopeful, but like any other work, you need to continue. Uh, and you work for genocide, not just for your own 1971 genocide, that's part of it. But you work for genocide so that in future, no other genocide takes place. Unfortunately, we already have another one, uh, and very near to Bangladesh, and we are suffering for that. 
uh, we are hosting 1.1 million, 1.1 million Rohingya refugees who are also victims uh, of, a, of a genocide. So uh, it's very important to flag and to get this recognition so that in future we don't have another genocide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Ahmed. Truly uh, a wonderful piece of remarks. And it helped us to understand the narrative of genocide and why our genocide must be recognized. Excellencies, now I'd like to request to come up here. Our Excellency Saida Muna Tasrim, Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK. Assalamu alaikum. Honorable State Minister for Foreign Affairs, Government of the People's Republic of Bangladesh, His Excellency Mr. Muhammad Shariar Alam MP, um, His Excellency Mr. Vikram Dorai Swami, uh, High Commissioner of India to the UK, Professor Intiaz Hussain, my respected elder brother, <laughs> Intiaz Amit, sorry, um, distinguished. Um, Professor of Dhaka University of International Relations Department, as well as Director for the Center for Genocide, Dhaka University. Professor Amina Mahsin, uh, who's also traveling from Dhaka. So many distinguished uh, valiant freedom fighters who are sitting here today. Um, my very beloved British Bangladeshi community, and I can see Benu Bhai, who did the Mukti Gan in 1971. Uh, he's also a freedom fighter. And therefore, you know, a big hand to all our freedom fighters and I salute to them. Julian Francis, I would say another freedom fighter, Bangladeshi citizen. <laughs> Yesterday we tried to honor him in our small way. Um, thank you so much. I'm supposed to give welcome remarks and thank you so much for coming to our event uh, to attend. And what um, makes me happy is to see young uh, people, including children sitting over there. We want your generation to learn about that there was genocide committed in Bangladesh in 1971 on the soil of Bangladesh. There are plenty of evidences, but before saying anything, I'd like to pay my homage and my tribute to Father of the Nation of Bangladesh, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, who's the undisputed leader of Bangladesh independence and also architect of Bengali nationalism, who led the political, economic, and socio-cultural struggle of the Bengali people between 1947 and 1971. My homage to him, my homage to three million martyrs of our 1971 War of Liberation, uh, 400,000 women who are violated sexually during our War of Liberation, the intellectuals who were murdered, um, blindfolded, brutally murder murdered during 1971, and all other freedom fighters, my salute to the valiant freedom fighters, and everyone, all the common people who fought, who fought in our 1971 War of Liberation. And my special, special homage and respect and gratitude to the British Bengali, British Bangladeshi, Overseas Liberation Front. What we call the Overseas Liberation Front, Bangladesh High Commission London organized a, two exhibitions on them. Those people who encouraged the British politicians in 1971 to organize the Trafalgar Square demonstrations in August, in July, in March, April, leading up to December. All those overseas freedom fighters, or we call them organizers, uh, opinion builders, but we call them the overseas freedom fighters of Bangladesh Liberation War, those patriotic sons and daughters of Bangladesh from Birmingham, from London, from all over the UK, who women sold their jewelry to contribute and to support the War of Liberation of Bangladesh. Those people who organize the recognize Bangladesh, stop genocide, and release Sheikh Mujib demonstrations at the Trafalgar Square. My tribute and homage to them, and some of them are here today, some of them have passed away and left, so my special is High Commissioner of Bangladesh to the UK, a special recognition to them. Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman stepped into London from Pakistan <clears throat> prison on 8 January 1972. And he, was, he received a hero's welcome at number 10 by Conservative Prime Minister Edward Heath 
as well as a hero's welcome from the leader of the uh, Labour Party, uh, opposition, uh, Sir Harold Wilson, two times Prime Minister of UK later on. And I also pay a tribute to them for recognizing Bangladesh and supporting all the politicians from the UK, including Sir Peter Shore, Lord Fenner Brockway, Michael Burns MP, Labour Party, Lib Dem Party, Lord Peter David Shaw, and then Lord David Martin, Lib Dem, and uh, Foreign Minister of Ireland, Sir Sean McBride. Many more names, many more politicians who sat side by side with Justice Abu Said Chaudhry, the first um, rep special representative of the uh, Mujib Nagar government in globally, as well as with our Bangladeshi British brothers and sisters, our overseas freedom fighters. They supported the liberation of Bangladesh, but more importantly, they recognized there was genocide committed in Bangladesh. So I'd like to just recall that on early April 1971, uh, the leadership of Sir Peter Shaw, he was the um, MP for Bethnal Green and Bow at that time, but he was also the chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, Foreign Affairs Select Committee at the British Parliament in early 1971. And you know, there are many literature which says by just on 25 March, nearly 100,000 people were killed. So early April 1971, Lord Peter Shaw moved a motion at the British Parliament where it was mentioned mass atrocities were being committed in Bangladesh, uh, in East Pakistan actually. And later on, there was another, res another motion uh, by uh, Lord Peter Shaw where 233 members of Parliament, crossbench, uh, from across different parties, had signed up to a petition, it's called Action Bangladesh, that there was genocide in Bangladesh, stop genocide, and also recognize Bangladesh. These two were the headlines. These two, were, these two motions were adopted in early April 1971. And I want to pay my gratitude to all those people who, uh, and the British Parliament at that time which recognized uh, Bangladesh genocide. And of course, there's so much literature in books which are published and journalists who are British, uh, including Taylor and Francis, Routledge. I do want to mention one, just for one example. Um, and this was... Um, a book by Taylor and Francis, which says, West Pakistan looked down upon their eastern neighbors, calling the area low-lying land of low-lying people, who polluted the area with non-Muslim values. Jones, 2010. Now, this book is published by Taylor and Francis. And there are so many publications here in London, in the UK, that you can research. But the fat, sad thing is that we haven't really collected them. So after, and thanks to Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, um, you may be late, but late is better than never. So in 2017, uh, the Bangladesh Parliament, under the leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, recognized 25th of March as Bengali Genocide Day. And Bangladesh High Commission London have been observing it since I have joined her as High Commissioner. And each time we have gathered quite a few experts from around the world because we had to do it online during COVID. And uh, I remember that um, there's this uh, teacher, she, she professor, Joanne uh, Di Giorgio Lutz, a department of uh, political science and head of department, Texas A&M University. She was telling us that there are international jurists journals and genocide lawyers journals, but there are not too many articles in those journals on Bangladesh genocide. And these uh, genocide experts and lawyers, they get together, they consult, they do symposiums and seminars, and she said, I had, we had discussed so many genocide, but we didn't discuss the Bangladesh genocide. Now, she advised us that you need to write more articles on these journals, which are uh, regular law review and others on genocide. So I would request, and the reason why Bangladesh High Commission has partnered with the uh, Center for Genocide, but more importantly, our own uh, British Bangladeshi professor, Bias, is because you know we wanted the academics in the UK should write about it. The university should write about it. And I know that there must be people who are actually teaching. I know that there are professors uh, of Bengali origin and heritage at the London School of Economics, at SOAS, at UCL. And I urge upon them that could you write more? And we from the High Commission can give you all the references. We have collected some so that we can create awareness amongst British media, British civil servants, politicians. Um, I mean, on the politicians, I will do that. But you know, creating this um, you know, uh, narrative and with evidence of Bangladesh genocide, in the UK, we need the academicians to acknowledge that. And uh, 
Uh, High Commission looks forward to working with UCL as well as many other universities here, uh, most of them Oxford, Cambridge, LSE, that have South Asian institutes, to create this narrative. And then we can take it back to the British Parliament, because last uh, year, 2021, was Golden Jubilee of Bangladesh Independence, and I did approach Ms. Rushnar Ali, Ali MP. Uh, who's the chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Bangladesh, who's also the chair on All-Party Parliamentary Group on Rohingya. But she said that at this point, British Parliament doesn't acknowledge genocides which are not acknowledged by the United Nations. Now, we have to work on it, but at least a recognition uh, at the British Parliament would be nice. But more importantly, it should start with the academics, the researchers, uh, and collaborate with Taki University, and we, we look forward to, you know, uh, also working and partnering those with uh, Center for Genocide. Before ending, I would like to especially uh, take this opportunity to express my gratitude to uh, our Honorable State Minister. As you all know that he has been State Minister in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs since 2014. And he has done, what can I say, he's a role model uh, and he's always giving the alternate narrative, the diplomatic narrative of everything that uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs aspires to do. So he has been that representative, and I'm very proud to call him my Honourable State Minister. Uh, he, the Honourable State Minister, is visiting the UK because we organised, you know, this is the fifth anniversary of the Rohingya crisis, and Professor Imtia has mentioned that's another genocide that's being, um, you know, adjudicated at the International Court of Justice. And uh, yesterday at the British Parliament, again, we had an acknowledgement that genocide is being committed in Myanmar on the Rohingyas, and Bangladesh is bearing the burden of that. So um, he came here for that principally, and also we tried to organize a Bengali genocide event at the UCL. And uh, this morning he spoke at the Chatham House on what to expect at COP27, uh, narratives from Bangladesh and Egypt. So, uh, and he had meetings at the Foreign Office with British ministers. So I want to thank him for uh, you know, being part of this event and we look forward to hearing to him, hearing him. Thank you. Joy Bangla. Thank you, Her Excellency, Saida Munat Asni, Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, now I'll request someone to come here who is uh, very close to us, uh, a veteran Indian diplomat who has just come to London and he served as the Indian High Commissioner in Bangladesh for two years and created an impeccable impact, I must say. Uh, Her Excellency Vikram Dorai Sami, Indian High Commissioner. His Excellency, um, I, I apologize. His Excellency Vikram Dorai Sami, Indian High Commissioner. Welcome to London, sir. The floor is yours. Your Excellency, Your Excellency uh, Shahriyar Saab, uh, my dear friend, High Commissioner Saeed Amanat Asneem, my old friend from Dhaka, Professor Imtiaz Ahmed, uh, Julian Da over there from Dhaka also. He may look like he's British, but his heart <laughs> is, ba is, ba is Bangladeshi. And as, as has been all his work, freedom fighters uh, here, present here, to all our friends, British Bangladeshi community, Salaam Alaikum, and a great pleasure to be here amongst you at UCL. The history of what happened in 1971, as we all know, is only now being accounted for. It is a lapse in our collective memory that we have let this gap remain for so long. It is, and I believe our collective failure to fully honor the martyrs of 1971, most and if not all of whom were Bangladeshi. Imtiaz Saab talked about the People's Republic of Bangladesh. In my mind, that is an important point. Today, that word has somehow gotten a different connotation. But the reason for why it was so relevant and remains relevant is because this was a people's war. It was a war that the people of Bangladesh took up to protect their language, their identity, and their culture. It is also something that makes Bangladesh a truly unique country, not just in South Asia. I think Imtiaz Bhai was being modest. It is in the world. A people who stood up for who they were, 
for their language, for their culture. It was not an, ex uh, an exclusive, exclusivist agenda, it was an inclusive agenda. The idea of a Bangladesh for all. It was a remarkable idea and this, I think, is what makes Bangladesh unique. I am, of course, biased. Uh, I happen to love your country very much. Well, in this case, I mean Bangladesh, not, not only Britain, but Bangladesh too. It's also true that that comes from a place of respect for Bangladesh. A people who went through what they did in 1971 are a remarkable people. This war, this conflict, this struggle is deserving of its recognition just as it is deserving of the justice that has long been denied to the people who lost lives or the people who lost family. And frankly, you can dispute numbers, as some academics have, but you cannot dispute history. That history of what happened in Bangladesh is abundantly known and well recognized. It needs recognition in an official sense. In April of 1971, the Parliament of India had actually passed a resolution on this. But we would not know enough about this and it would have long been consigned to the um, international discourse about South Asia had it not been for three very remarkable men. Archer Blood, who was the United States Consul General at that time in Dhaka. Uh, Simon Dring, a British journalist and Neville Mascarinas, a Pakistani journalist who wrote, if I'm not wrong, for a British newspaper. These men brought this, these realities to the rest of the world, which would otherwise have dismissed it for geopolitical and other reasons. We owe them a debt, debt of gratitude. What happens next? The process of recognition, and of course we look forward to hearing from uh, Minister of State Shariar Saab about this, is of course a complex one. But we should all, as friends of an international rules-based, law-based order, recognize that when you let wrong go by unrecognized, forget the punishment part, just the recognition, when you let that happen, you leave open space for more such crimes to take place. And that, frankly, is just a fact. It is not more it is not unreasonable to say that nations and people are required to reflect on history. The question of legality, again, is, in my view, subordinate to the concept of right and to the concept of justice. And I think Imtiaz, Professor Imtiaz has made that point, that there is no doubt about what constitutes genocide, but also there is no statute of limitations. You can't say it happened 51 years ago and therefore it's all right if, if we say, okay, look, forget about it, bad stuff happens in history. The world today accepts that genocide, whenever, wherever it happened, can and should be recognized. And what happened in Bangladesh can and must be recognized. What can we do practically? To British Bangladeshi friends, of course, this is your history, much more than it is mine. But to British friends, and of course, speaking as an Indian, we need, at least when we visit Bangladesh, to also visit the museums, the history, the killing fields that are commemorated there, and to actually take back from, from there a sense of the narrative and a sense of what actually happened there. You can actually see this. There are, there are very evocative memorials placed all over Bangladesh, which frankly just don't get visited. And I think it's a huge human tragedy. You can go to Chuknagar, you can go to Sayadpur, you can go to the beautiful memorial set up just outside Dhaka where the intellectuals were murdered. And you can see what actually happened. And this is not to create rancor, it is to create memory. Creating memory, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important task that all of us have. Because without that, the next generation, the young British Bangladeshi uh, boys and girls who are here, will not know where they came from and what happened to all of us. Because what happened to you happened to all of us in South Asia. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. And in that spirit, I, I'm delighted, as always, to be part of anything that concerns Bangladesh, a country that is very dear to my country, but most of all, very dear to me. Thank you.
Thank you, His Excellency, Indian High Commissioner to the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, now we'll hear from the chief guest of today's event, His Excellency, Mr. Mohammad Shari Alum MP, Honorable State Minister for Foreign Affairs of Bangladesh. Thank you. Um, respected uh, uh, Professor Imtiaz, Indian High Commissioner uh, to the UK, uh, Vikram, uh, Bangladesh High Commissioner to the UK, uh, Saida Muna, uh, friends, members of uh, Bangladesh community. Uh, we have uh, quite a few office bearers here, I can see, uh, representing uh, different uh, constituencies uh, of uh, Greater London. Uh, my uh, colleagues from Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, friends from uh, media, uh, assalamu alaikum and uh, very good uh, afternoon. Uh, we have gathered here today uh, and uh, to speak about and talk about a very uh, sensitive, uh, very close to our heart, and something that I am afraid the new generation uh, of uh, Bangladeshis, especially uh, among the non-resident Bangladeshis, are uh, nearly forgotten. But it's the Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government and the parliament uh, I take note of uh, Dr. Bayas Ahmed's um, comment uh, why it has taken us so long to pass a resolution in the parliament. Uh, but I think uh, it's uh, better late than never. Whether or not we uh, call upon the international community to recognize the genocide uh, we did actually start the process of trialing the, uh, in the International uh, Court of uh, uh, Tribunal uh, people who were behind these genocides. Uh, I do have a written speech and some of this will be a uh, little repetitive for people who are aware. We have very senior citizens and freedom fighters. But we also have um, young uh, British Bangladeshis. I think it's very important for them to know the past. In the name of God and the United Pakistan, Dhaka is today a crushed and frightened city. After 24 hours of ruthless, cold-blooded shelling, by the Pakistan army. As many as 7,000 people are dead. Large areas have been leveled and East Pakistan's fight for independence has been brutally put to an end. The Daily Telegraph on 30th March 1971. This was the beginning of the historic article. Tanks crushed revolt in Pakistan, 7,000 slaughtered, homes burned by renowned British foreign correspondent Simon Dring, which for the first time brought the news of Bangladesh genocide in 1971 to global attention. The genocide that started with the infamous Operation Searchlight unfolded the most heinous, shocking, and unprecedented brutality unleashed by the Pakistani occupation forces on the dark night of 25th March 1971. Such abhorrent crime against humanity committed on unarmed civilians, including women and children, continued for more than nine months, killing millions, sexually violating women and girls, torturing, torturing villages and towns, and systematically eliminating the intellectuals, as we saw uh, at the beginning in the audiovisual presentation, based on its linguistic and religious identity. Today, I feel humbled that I stand here with you 
at this high level symposium to refresh your memory or other our memory as well about the forgotten Bangladesh genocide and thank you all for being here to express solidarity with our legitimate demand for international recognition of the 1971 genocide. I convey my sincere gratitude to the University College of London, Center for Genocide Studies of University of Dhaka, and Bangladesh High Commission in London for organizing today's very important event. Until the Second World War, the world didn't know how to define or deal with the killing of millions of people during warfare. British Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill struggled to find a suitable name for the grave atrocity and massacre committed in the Second World War and termed them as crime without a name. It was then that renowned Polish lawyer Raphael Lemkin for the first time coined the term genocide and pioneered the first ever human rights treaty known as the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, 1948. With the global commitment, nunca mas, in English it's never again. But genocide happened again and again and the gravest one after the Second World War was the Bangladesh Genocide of 1971. The Article 2 of the Genocide Convention says the term genocide includes I quote, acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. And all the evidence, documents and news reports, both local and international bear testimony that such was the case during 1971 in Bangladesh. Since the creation of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan in 1947, it was historically evident that the Bengalis in East Pakistan were systematically subjected to racial, religious, linguistic, and ethnic prejudices and discrimination by the West Pakistani rulers. In the face of such oppression and discrimination, the freedom-loving and secular Bengalis rallied behind the undisputed leader, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, to fight for their rights to self-determination which culminated into the landslide victory of the Aumi League in the 1970 general election, setting the stage for the Bengali nationalist leader to become the Prime Minister of undivided Pakistan. Instead of handing over power to democratically elected Aumi League and its legitimate leader, the Bangabundu, the Pakistani ruler launched Operation Searchlight to annihilate the Bengali people and crush their struggle for freedom. As famous researcher Mr. Nitin Pai suggested, the Pakistani army strategized Bangladesh genocide into three phases over the course of 1971. And those were, starting from late March to early May, the first phase of the genocide, the Operation Searchlight, took place as a massive murder campaign. The indiscriminate use of heavy artillery in urban areas, particularly in Dhaka, killed many including Hindu student at Dhaka University. Second, search and destroy was the second phase where Pakistani forces methodically slaughtered Bengalis from many, May to October, in which the Pakistan army targeted women to rape, abduct, and enslave. Third phase, known as scorched earth, was the third phase beginning in early December and targeted and killed 1,000 intellectuals and professionals, such as doctors, lawyers, writers, journalists, teachers, creative thinkers, cultural activists, and engineers in Dhaka. So the initial assault was targeted to exterminate an entire nation with genocidal act in which the Pakistan military killed thousands of people within the first month of genocide. The targeted mass killing of 25th March is a only genocide in modern times that resulted from a policy of deliberately containing or suppressing the democratic aspiration of the people. For them, it was an audacity, them means to the Pakistanis, it was an audacity of the Bengalis under their leader, Bangabundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, 
to even dream of ruling, let alone having a separate sovereign country. As many as 3 million people were killed. More than 200,000 were raped and close to 20 million people were displaced and had to flee the country, taking shelter in various refugee camps set up by the government of India in West Bengal, Tripura, Meghalaya, Assam, and other parts of India. The atrocity crimes included killing, physical and mental torture, rape, destruction of a nation, intent to destroy culture and religion, burning towns, ports, and villages, and so on. There was not a single place in Bangladesh in where the flames of Pakistani's barbarous acts didn't burn everything. The main target of General Yahya Khan and his army was to wipe out the ex existence of Bengali nation from world history forever. The heinous activities of Pakistani demons in Bangladesh crossed the atrocity of all previous genocides. It was General Yahya Khan reported to have said, I quote, kill three million of them and the rest will eat out of our hands. Which clearly shows that right from very beginning to suppress the Bengali nation, meanest form of genocidal act was their target. Numerous investigations, surveys, estimations, and research have been conducted on the 1971 genocide. The international media, scholarly researcher, and some policymakers have highlighted the atrocities committed by the Pakistan military against the Bengalis in 1971, calling it selective genocide, the bloodbath in Bengal, one of the bloodiest slaughter in modern times, and so on. Thousands of testimonies and interviews with victims and oppressors were gathered and meticulously studied, and overwhelming evidence shows the irrefutable reality that what occurred in 1971 in Bangladesh was genocide in every sense of the legally condified and internationally recognized term. One of the most important pieces of account about the 1971 Bangladesh genocide comes from Pakistan itself in the form of the report of Hamidur Rahman Commission inquiry into the 1971 war. Even though substantial portion of the report remain highly classified in inaccessible, partly released excerpts indicated that mass killing of civilians had genuinely occurred during the 1971. The report also recounts army officials' testimony about plotting to arrest and interrogate Bangladeshi intellectuals in December 1971 based on a list they compiled with the cooperation of local collaborators. Even after all these and defining the atrocity of 1971 in all possible forms of genocide, excellencies, unfortunately, the international community is yet to recognize the killing as genocide. Right after the Liberation War, Father of the Nation, Bangamundu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, enacted the Bangladesh Collaborators Order 1972. It was a special tribunal to try those who willingly cooperated with the Pakistan Army for killing millions. Then the International Crimes Tribunal Act 1973 was enacted to try the perpetrators who had committed international crimes within the territory of Bangladesh. After a long haul of at atrocity, autocratic military government in Bangladesh, and that probably goes on to explain one of your question, why it has taken us so long, finally Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government established the International Crimes Tribunal of Bangladesh, and since 2009, the tribunals are trying the perpetrators rendering long pending justice to the victims and their families. And you all know very well uh, the issues that we have faced during those trials, and still there are certain resistance from certain quarter. But it has widely been accepted in the international community. In 2017, the Bangladesh Parliament unanimously adopted a resolution to observe 25th March as Day of Genocide, marking the brutality carried out by the Pakistan Army on the black night of 25th March 1971. And since then, we have been committed to work relentlessly to put an end to genocide once and, and for all in the world. We sincerely appreciate the very recent remarkable U.S. resolution introduced 
by the U.S. Congressman Steve Shabbat and Congressman Ro Khanna in the U.S. House of Representatives to declare Pakistan army action against Bengalis Hindus in 1971 in Bangladesh war of liberation as genocide and crime against humanity. We believe this would be a historic initiative towards the international recognition of Bangladesh genocide. I would be eagerly looking forward to my British Parliament colleagues to bring about a parliamentary resolution of such stature which would set an example for many to follow. And this is something I have discussed with uh, over um, lunch uh, with the member of House of Lords and uh, the APPG chair, uh, Lord Billy Moria, who paid a, very, a visit to Bangladesh. You'd be knowing him very well. And his father uh, uh, was uh, uh, a freedom fighter as well. He's, uh, you know, he suggested that if you want to visit Bangladesh, you must, he insisted to his uh, colleagues at the House of Lords, that you must visit the liberation, the two places you must visit in Bangladesh is the Liberation War Museum and the Bangabundu Memorial at Dhanmundi 32. And he was so moved that I think, I do not think this will be uh, an issue to convince uh, the senior member of the Houses of Parliament in coming months. Respected audience, we the people of Bangladesh endured the horror of 1971. And even after 50 years, it still haunts us. Time cannot heal such wounds and should never do. When we talk about ending violence, crimes against humanity, cruelty against human beings, and promoting human rights across the globe, we must not let any crimes of that magnitude go unaccounted for. What we endured in 1971 must be duly acknowledged, well documented, recognized, and today, we call upon our friends to stand with us, raise your voice, express your solidarity, and demand for international recognition for Bangladesh genocide of 1971. And that is something to answer your question, what to be done. And scholars like yourself, which you are doing a very commendable job here, I'll be calling upon other members of uh, the community here uh, to organize similar events in other uh, institutions. So this almost forgotten uh, dark chapter of the history of the world is known to the future generation, the present day leaders. I shared my experience with the House of Lords. We are moved by the recent uh, resolution table uh, in the United States. And this is something I have discussed with my counterparts uh, in my, during my recent visit in the United States. Our missions abroad for the last couple of years are observing this day as genocide day in all missions. But it, our actions shouldn't be limited within observance of the day under the guidance of the Bangladeshi missions abroad. I think it is the responsibility of the Bangladeshi diaspora abroad to host similar event at different institution, no matter uh, despite your political allegiance, I think it should be uh, something that all party, I repeat, all party, not just Bangladesh Army League, who should raise their voice and share the history. And within their community, there will always be someone who has lost their dear ones during this genocidal act by Pakistan military. I thank you all. Thank you very much for your patience, Harry. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangla. Thank you, His Excellency, Honorable State Minister for Foreign Affairs, Bangladesh, for his wonderful remarks and his kind instruction to facilitate international recognition for Bangladesh genocide in 1971. Excellencies,